some specific improvements to ensure we with the government. We contributed to report. It wasn't a question of the absence of report. It was a question of implementation of recommendations. Now, finally, I think that the balance should be very, very clear, and we're still debating how to deal with that particular uh, challenge, and hopefully this uh, conference will provide some recommendations in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yona. Thanks to all of you for uh, really um, interesting and thought-provoking remarks. I'm going to um, throw out a few questions just to get our minds rolling and the conversation uh, going. Um, I, I, I find it all... Um, I'm particularly fascinated by this whole issue of the, the intelligence failure and, and and, and you know the issue, the issue of whether whether this could have been uh, been prevented. It has you know a personal interest in this, given what happened in Oslo um, a few weeks ago. We're now in Norway debating why didn't the intelligence service stop under Freyvik, and uh, you know what what did we what do we know about the anti-jihad movement to which he he, he belongs. Um, some of my questions are, are, are kind of directed to all of you, and some of them some of them are a little bit more specific. I'll start with a specific one for you, um, Mark. Um, you point out the very important role of bureaucracy and bureaucratic politics in all, in all of this, and um, I, I I'm wondering. If, uh, I, I would like to hear your views on the sort of the implications of the growth in the U.S. intelligence bureaucracy. Um, uh, what does it mean for its ability to um, adapt to new uh, types of phenomena? Uh, presumably there's a, there's a whole lot of, sort of path dependency here. In When you hire a lot of new people, most many of whom have, have, have tra training in Middle East studies, for example, and you have, and then something comes up, for example, um, right-wing extremism. How, 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 how do you think that, if, if this happens, how, how, how do you think that the community will be able to, to deal with, with, with that? Another question, and this, and this goes, I think, to both you, Mark, and to, to, to Cindy, uh, concerns the, the, the role of academics uh, in, in, in all of this, the, the role of academics uh, in intelligence uh, ass assessment, in your view, has 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 do, do do academics have more or less of an impact on on intelligence assessment after nine nine eleven? In your paper, Cindy, you 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 you, you mention uh, you, you talk about the fact that some some academics had a great deal of influence on thinking in the intel community. Um, Anecdotally, I, I mean, I, 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 I run across, I've, I've met some senior intelligence officials uh, who tell me that they don't find very much useful at all in uh, in, in the university, in, 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 in the in the academy. Um, presumably, with the growth of the intel bureaucracy, um, uh, the need for uh, insights from from academics might. Decrease. So, do you have any thoughts thoughts on this? Um, I have another question specifically for your paper, Cindy, regarding um, this intriguing hypothesis about um, women uh, and and their over uh, representation in, in um, uh, terrorist uh, um, among terrorist analysts in, in intelligence organizations. And I wonder what you think it tells us about, um, about intelligence analysis. And I'm also wondering whether you think there is anything particular about terrorism analysis as opposed to other types of intelligence analysis that uh, um, may explain this, this over-representation. Is there a particular sensitivity that you need to study terrorist groups or jihadi groups? And, um, I'd just, I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on, on, on that. Um, um, a question for 
for, for you, Mary, um, you, you gave an, a, a very good overview of, uh, the, of, of sort of the, into the ideological universe of, of, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and this sort of represents the state of the art of 2011. But I wonder how much of this was known to us then? How much of this was known to us in, in, 2000, in 2001 and, and, and before? If you could speak to that, that would be uh, uh, very interesting. Um, another uh, question or point is that the, the, the factors that you mentioned, or the, 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 the components of this universe, uh, are sort of the common denominator, if you will, of this conglomerate of actors. Well, uh, we all know that there is a great deal of variation here, a great deal of tactical variation from uh, group to group, uh, from movement to movement, from you know, within one group, from one year to the, to the next. You know, with this kind of common denominator, these stable principles, how do we predict variation in behavior? Um, your thoughts on that would be uh, uh, very interesting. Um, and finally, um, for, for Yona, um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what you think are the main differences uh, between the academic and the, and the, and the intelligence-based sort of understanding of Al-Qaeda uh, prior to 9-11. And thank you all for fascinating papers. <coughs> I guess I'll go first. I'll, I'll leave the second question exclusively to Cindy, since I think she has more, uh, by far more expertise there on, on the influence of academics. Um, in terms of you know, growth, the influence of growth and size on intelligence analysis, um, I think I would say, and, and, I, and I, I, I draw here not only on the, the research uh, that I've done in the, the history of assessments of the jihadist threat, but sort of more generally on my experiences in the intelligence community, which were not doing counterterrorism. Um, uh, I would argue that larger intelligence organizations are uh, quite good at you know carrying forward in a particular direction in a you know thorough sort of way. But if you're looking for really radically new ideas, uh, if you're looking for you know I iconoclastic uh, analyses, if you are dealing with a situation in the world where you had perhaps a sharp discontinuity that needs to be uh, you know understood or where somebody sees a sharp discontinuity coming, those sorts of issues, I think small size is much better. Um, it's easier to get uh, you know, consensus among four people than it is among 400. Um, and um, so I, I think it's, uh, and I, I, again, I'd be interested in city thoughts on this, I think it'd be no, it's no coincidence that if you look at sort of where most, not all, but most of the people who are really doing serious work on this jihadist threat back uh, in the period of the, you know, early to mid 1990s when nobody gave a damn, um, what did you have? You had one of them was at State INR, which is a very small intelligence organization, not a lot of bureaucracy, and the portfolios of individual analysts are so, so broad that, you know, very few people are, except for your actual management is in a position to disagree with you on much of anything. You had uh, people working for Mike Scheuer, who are not only not a very large group, um, but also sort of closeted in their own little worlds, right? Um, and you had, um, at, at least initially, you had Cindy and a couple of her colleagues who were working on Afghanistan uh, and came to it that way, which again, I imagine at the time, and I don't know how much of this you can, you're allowed to speak to, but it was probably a fairly small uh, little community as well. Um, my guess would be, and I, and I say this with absolutely no malice at all to the people who do, you know, did Soviet or do Russian things, for instance, but if, God forbid, if Al-Qaeda had emerged out of, you know, suburban Moscow or something with the enormous intelligence bureaucracies that we had working on, you know, the Soviet Union and Russia, that we would have probably not have been, not, not have seen what was coming nearly, you know, as far in advance as, in fact, we did. Um, so that would be my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, that's interesting. That's uh, often, you know, innovation in, in any field comes from, by definition, one person or a small number of people, right? This isn't any different. Um, role of academics and intelligence. You know, before 9-11, we had, we tried to reach out to academia a lot, and it was hard because nobody studied Al-Qaeda. You know? <coughs> we, there were people who were very good at, at understanding terrorism, Ruth Hoffman, Martha Crenshaw, people like that, we reached out to, and we did, 
we were able, especially from Arthur Crenshaw, to earn a lot, to learn a lot about, in general, how terrorist groups work, how terrorism comes about. So to be able to put Al Qaeda into this broader context of being a terrorist organization. But since nobody was really under talking about Al Qaeda itself, um, comments that academics made on Al Qaeda itself generally were counterproductive <coughs> because we had, again, we were a small community, we were women in an operational environment, and so it was really easy to ignore us, frankly. And because um, people wanted to anyway, Hezbollah was the important issue in Iran and all that kind of stuff. And um, so they tended to, people in the agency tended to look to outside experts more than to us. And when those outside experts had studied the, the yeah, organization, they start, they said, say things like, well, you know, I assume it's X, Y, and Z based on my study of whatever happened in the 1980s or 1970s. And it was just wrong. It was wrong. <coughs> and it gave people false comfort, I think, on the policy and the upper management levels that we weren't, they weren't dealing with anything significantly different. So, you know, that, that was a problem. Now, if you had been able to marry up that broader understanding of issues with the details that people can see in the intelligence community of an emerging, of an emerging threat, of an emerging issue, then wow, what you could have done early would have been spectacular. But there are all these barriers to that kind of cooperation, not least of which is you know, the restrictions placed on academics who get access to classified material. It just doesn't work very well. Uh, and I, we need to find a way to do something <coughs> about that problem. I should also mention there were journalists, um, you know, on this early, really a lot of our early outreach efforts, well, in terms of what we would like to read, uh, were, were journalistic efforts. People on the ground seeing what was happening. On the role of women, I was a little hesitant to bring this up because I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, it's just a fact, and you know, I'm not the first one to. Uh, to remark on it, why do I think that <coughs> women were so prominent in doing this job, and in fact still are, very much so. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about this, this in the weeds, figuring stuff out part of the job. You know, it's, a friend of mine speculates that it's just patience. You know, she's a mom of five. And uh, <laughs> she says you need patience to watch things grow. So that's her theory. Um, another theory I've heard is that uh, women are, in general, more capable of seeing both the forest and the trees at the same time, which is absolutely essential to do this kind of work. You know, it could be a bureaucratic issue of the men all wanting to do something more glorious. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But that's why I think we need to study. We need to figure out what, what that was as we go forward. So there's a PhD dissertation? Yes. Absolutely, PhD dissertation. Somebody take it up. Um, uh, I don't know how much I have to add to this conversation about academics and the intel world, except to give my own personal experience, um, and which I think reflects something about where academia was at on 9-11. Um, I got interested in this subject uh, because I got interested in Islam, not uh, because I was interested in terrorism in the 1990s, uh, 1993 to be exact. So I spent uh, many years doing nothing but reading everything I could get my hands on about uh, Islam, Islamic commentaries, the tafsir, all sorts of stuff. Um, great thing about doing a PhD is it gives you a methodology for becoming an expert in anything if you want to. And it takes, you know, six to eight years or so to become an expert, that's all. You just have to dedicate an hour or two a day to read and thinking. And, and I did things like present papers at conferences and stuff like that. So my, my expertise, um, and on the one hand, I was a professor of military history at Yale. That's what I was doing with my day job. And then in the evenings and my off hours, I was studying Islam. Um, and uh, so when 9-11 occurred, um, my first reaction was to wait for the people who did both things to show up and make a commentary on it. And nobody showed up. And this is, I think, the biggest gap at 9-11, and I think it persists actually through to today, and that is that uh, social scientists in general don't take religion seriously as an explanatory principle. And I actually, in my, my first few books, uh, pages of my, my book, Knowing the Enemy, talk about that problem. So um, 
uh, people today, um, since I would say about 2003 to 2004, there's a younger generation of academics who are being trained differently. Um, but the people who were the real experts before 9-11 had been purposely trained, at least in the United States, to have a blind spot when it came to religion and politics. So I think that that was probably the biggest gap. The one exception were people who were trained in religious studies. And um, they had absolutely no concept of what this meant in the real world. So they could tell you, here's what they're thinking, but when they asked why is that relevant, they couldn't explain it. And by the way, just to, to clarify, I was at Yale for 18 years, and I was never asked by one of my colleagues or my mentor, why is what you're doing relevant? It's just not a question they ask in academia. <laughs> I would ask why is it intellectually interesting, but never why is it relevant. So, um, you know, not to, to pick on people. Um, the, the other thing that's happened to me because of my uh, going back now, redoing my thinking, you know, all this research of, of the 1990s, and I, I write in a very um, historian trained method, which is I do all the primary research and writing first. Then I go back and I read what other people have said. So um, the, the piece that I actually uh, submitted has absolutely no secondary research attached to it. It's all, all based on primary documents and, and um, captured documents in particular. And um, what I was surprised to discover was that a conclusion that I had come to in sometime in 2007, 2008, that Al-Qaeda was uh, not a terrorist group at all, but was an insurgency, uh, was backed up by the material <coughs> in the 1990s. Because I had figured that was only true post 9-11. They'd been forced to become an insurgency in certain things because of um, our terrific CT work and, and stuff like that. But in fact, um, what I found was that was their plan all along. And uh, terrorism was a tactic they were using in order to sort of kick off their grand jihad, uh, global jihad. Um, since, Mary, you, you mentioned uh, Yale, if I may, um, I, I think um, Professor Aaron Laswell, who established uh, the Institute for Social and Behavioral Pathology, uh, he looked at terrorism as pathology in a very practical way. And um, I, I think um, the, the good news is that uh, the academic community, many of the institutions, uh, Yale in particular, we collaborated on these uh, issues, uh, clearly uh, played, uh, played a role to better understand uh, what the challenge is before 9-11. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, I think we have to make sure that we <laughs> remind ourselves again and again and again that all of us are in the same boat. It's not government, intelligence, and the academic, it's the role of the civic society. And uh, therefore, for a very long time, I can tell you from, uh, again, limited uh, personal uh, experience, that there was a cross fertilization between the academic community and the intelligence and the policy makers and parliaments and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, the role of the academics is to deal with open uh, sources. We have done that. The same information was available to the intelligence uh, community. Uh, we, uh, in the academic community, we were interested mostly in the trends. And it was very clear, uh, whereas the intelligence community, as all of us know, looks not only at the strategies, but also the tactics whether uh, Ben Levin slept here or there. Uh, and I think we uh, tried to share uh, information uh, because uh, we felt uh, that the, the threat of terrorism is a strategic threat. As I indicated before, that I think we have to think about the unthinkable. And Herman Kahn reminded us we worked with him, we worked with people who uh, actually dealt with weapons of mass destruction. We're doing it even at this particular time, Senator Nunn and, and uh, Lugar and so forth. So what I'm trying to say is that this is the business of everyone, and we try to share it. The problem was 
to connect the dots, as we know very well. And this is one, one of the issues. And I think in order to reduce the risks and to look at what is called success, then we have to strengthen our international cooperation, uh, as we know. And the latest uh, incident in Norway is another indication that we have to look at radicalization in general, not only the question of the so-called Islamic-based uh, terrorism, the Al-Qaeda. Uh, in the United States, we have this challenge of the foreign infinity, the crisis of loyalty, as we know. And it's not only the question of the religious links but uh, also the uh, right wing or the left wing or whatever it is. And we have to see it in a holistic view to understand the nature of the threat. And then we can develop some sensible, I think, strategies to reduce the risks. Thank you very much. Now we'll open up for questions from the floor. I'll take uh, pairs of questions. Um, In the lady of the front. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Linda Bishai. I'm with the U.S. Institute of Peace. I realize that the mandate of the panel was to look back at what we knew before 9-11, but because we have such a distinguished collection of panelists, I want to take the opportunity to ask you to look forward a little bit. And my question has to do with um, what opportunities there are looking forward to for the intelligence and academic community to reach out and uh, have discussions with the diplomatic corps. Um, and although I'm not actually a diplomat, I do interact with our diplomats quite frequently. And I also um, have a lot of on-the-ground experience in peace building. So what, and, and especially with, as the State Department you know, is standing up a uh, response operational team with CRS, um, they're going to have an awful lot of on-the-ground experience, and so what kinds of opportunities do you see to, uh, to talk to that community as well? Thank you. And one more question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Very stimulating panel. Uh, Richard Lobin is my name. I'm an anthropologist of Sudan, actually. Uh, but I work for the Naval War College teaching African studies. Um, my question, well, the whole panel is highly stimulating, but I think my question would be addressed to Dr. Habek in particular because we share apparently many common interests. And one of them would be looking backwards and a definitional issue of thinking of Al Qaeda not just as a terrorist group or jihadist group, or we should use the word Irhabi in a terrorist group. Uh, or a resistance group, or an anti-colonial group. There are many different hats that could be put onto this organization. And because we see it in a sort of simple prism, we fail to look back at, for example, Samori Torre, Othman Danfodio, the Mahdi of Sudan, the Prophet uh, Muhammad himself, who one could imagine, who did inspire, in fact, Osama bin Laden. So we have that general question looking backwards for historical evidence to understand the present. The other part of the question <clears throat> is looking much more far, further forward. Oh, how do these groups come to an end? Uh, because they usually do come to an end. And uh, since uh, operationally everyone is concerned about what are you going to do tomorrow and how do we bring this to an end, uh, I think we need to study not just the morphology, not just the evolution, although it's extremely important, uh, but we need to study precisely uh, what brings these groups you know, to a terminal point in their in their evolution. So those are my uh, principal questions. Maybe if I could one indulge you. Uh, I have been studying Sudan for 40 years. My wife has studied with the Grand Qadi of Sudan and wrote extensively on Sharia, uh, as well as with uh, Sheikh um, Ashmawi in Egypt. And uh, we mostly got ignored. Thank you. <laughs> Who would like to respond? I could take a crack at the first question on uh, reaching out to the diplomatic corps. Again, 
Uh, let me look back for a second. I've been out of government for four years, so it's hard for me to talk about exactly what's going on these days, but I can tell you what I've learned from what happened in the 90s. Um, we, when I was working in Afghanistan, we had a very robust relationship. The analysts were invited to, you know, everything from AID to Central, the emerging Central Asian Republics, everything. We talked a lot. Then the, uh, the directive came down that, you know, the president was really our only customer. And all of those, all of those interchanges, all of those products that went out to more working level folks, and I would consider undersecretaries of state working level, really, um, it all stopped for the most part. And so we weren't able to have those exchanges. I even had an event where I, plan I scheduled a meeting downtown with an undersecretary, and it was canceled behind my back. So we've got to find a way. I mean, we, we need to be doing this. It works great. It saves a lot of people. Um, we did some great work on you know, refugee relief and other issues. And uh, we've got to get back to that. Yeah. So uh, I, I think you know you can um, look at Al Qaeda's ideology and uh, their actions, and you can find um, precedents in some ways in uh, uh, previous groups. Um, the group that you mentioned in uh, Nigeria, the Sokoto, um, and well, I'm thinking of the 19th century and the 18th century. Um, has, you know, there are some sorts of things I've, I've just gotten done reading a, a very nice uh, um, primary source on, on that as well. Um, but always, always, always there are huge distinctions and Al-Qaeda is always on this fringe off by itself, you know, hanging from a little branch as far as it comes to ideology and to actions. So you can always look back and find these pieces well, they probably you know knew these guys or read about these guys to think this was a great idea, but always they have taken it to some sort of really wacky extreme. I actually like your use of the term James Bond villains because their use of that kind of stereotypical language and their visionary you know to blow up the moon is just kind of that's what it, that's separate California from the rest of the country by starting the earthquake. Yes, um, break the United States up into its 52 states. <laughs> so I, I find, I find you know, presence, you can always find presence, but they're always off their niche. What worries me is every place that they've gone, they have successfully radicalized local jihadist groups that were otherwise sort of reasonable sounding in some ways to agree with them and to push them off towards this edge. So let's take Iraq as a great example. 19, uh, if you take a look at um, all of the jihadist groups that were around or the insurgency groups that were around in, in 2003, uh, the vast majority had some sort of linkages back to, to Saddam. And you know, Saddamist is a good description of them. When Saddam got captured, that shifted. And slowly but surely, they became sort of nationalist, religious. And where was Al-Qaeda? You know, off blowing up things every once in a while. They were nothing. They were this tiny little radical fringe, you know? And by the end of 2004, though, this nationalist religious organization you know, of the uh, jihadists you know, was completely destroyed in Fallujah. And the result was that they got pushed towards another radical fringe. In 2005, they slowly become more Salafi jihadists. And, and then in 2006, when the mosque goes up, suddenly everybody becomes Al-Qaeda. So through a series of purposeful actions and through a series of our own actions, we we push the entire insurgency off into this very radical direction. And the same kind of thing has happened in Somalia, it's happening in Yemen as we speak, it's happening every place these guys take an interest. They take what were um, you know, sort of understandable jihadist groups and push them into this, off into this limb. And that's what concerns me. Can I really just briefly comment on this thing about how terrorist groups end? Um, Audrey Prone and among others has done good work on this, um, and, and it's obviously a very important question, but to, to my mind, uh, an equally, and I actually would argue, more important question with regard to Al-Qaeda and their brethren is one that you don't see a lot of attention paid to, and that is how do ideologies or religions or denominations or whatever word you want to use but uh, go away? How do they end? 
Um, and you know, I've discussed this uh, in, a, in a lot of different places, including in classrooms here uh, at this university, and I often have people tell me that either one of two things, either it's wrong to try and make a religion go away, Arguing to have Islam go away, I'm arguing to have solid Jihadism go away, and or and or that you know um, uh, religions, denominations, ideologies are permanent, and that's just simply not true. Historically, not true. Um, you don't actually have to look very hard to find any number of branches of Islam, Christianity, Judaism that have gone away, plus as well for that matter, entire religions that have in fact gone away. Um, and I think that a, a more attention in the, the context of our present strategic situation needs to be paid to, have, uh, to how to do that. And I've got, I'm, I'm you know, I, I think this is one of these places where our disinclination to discuss religion has not served us well. I don't think any of us need to be any more apologetic about, uh, you know, enunciating a goal of having Salafi jihadism go away than we were about enunciating a goal of having Nazism go away. Um, doesn't mean we want Islam to go away. Uh, this means we want these, these particular bad people who understand it in a particularly pernicious, genocidal way to vanish. Thank you. Uh, I'll take two more, more questions. And uh, please keep in mind that we'll have plenty of time later on this afternoon and tomorrow to discuss the future and the present. So I would encourage you to um, ask questions that pertain to the past. Uh, one question to the gentleman at the back. The red tie. I am Major Mike Nielsen with the uh, U.S. Air Force Fellows. Um, are we as a society uh, really missing the point here? Uh, it's only been mentioned once that terrorism is not an ideology. It's a tactic employed by people with radical ideologies. And we've only been talking about the Islamic world in 1986 on. Uh, every Marxist movement of the 20th century started with radical fringe people with <coughs> radical ideologies that started out as terrorists and sometimes terrorist organizations or organizations that play terrorism uh, go away by becoming the glorious leaders of communist countries. I mean, can we learn from the experiences of the 20th century and apply uh, how terrorism was was started, Marxist movement turned into an insurgency, irregular warfare, and eventually um, a revolution? Can we learn from those uh, organizations and apply it to uh, Al Qaeda? Hi, I'm Caroline Craig Day from uh, Homeschool Government of Liberty University. And my question is actually specifically for Professor Alexander. Um, I'm a really visual person, so I couldn't help but notice your really interesting collage um, on your last slide. And it was um, the words liberty, freedom, justice, and equality, and you well, I don't know who made it, but it was letters taken from those words to spell security. And I was just curious to know if you were hinting that um, by trying to make a better security, we were taking away from liberty and freedom. So, yeah, would you like to? Uh, um. Obviously, the, uh, the questions of the audience um, are very uh, important. We can spend, as we say, a semester to, to discuss uh, the Sudan and uh, East uh, Africa and uh, the vacuum that uh, it created for uh, Ben Laden initially to, to flourish. We, we know that. And um, one of the major uh, contributing uh, factors, obviously, in that area uh, as you know very well from your own work in anthropology is the um, ethnic, racial, religious, and tribal intolerance and violence. The good news is finally we got, let's say, South Sudan is a new member of the international community, so we need a great deal of uh, patience. But uh, anyway, um, I, I wanted to, to, uh, to mention that um, we must uh, learn the lessons of history in terms of what works and what does not work. And um, uh, obviously, as the um, philosopher of Hegel mentioned, we learn from history that we don't learn from history. And this is the big mistake. Um, and uh, I, I think we, we have to throw uh, these uh, this lessons in order to, to deal with, uh, with the future. 
Now, I, I think uh, those who, who believe that uh, uh, you can go and, uh, and kill uh, the uh, Al-Qaeda leadership, then you can eliminate the, the Al-Qaeda concept and ideology, obviously they're wrong. I think we need both uh, art power and soft power to deal with the, the issues. The responsibility of states is uh, first to protect their citizens at the uh, home and abroad, and clearly the, the role of the law enforcement in the military uh, is, is critical. But uh, we, we have to deal with the uh, soft power uh, aspect in terms of combating uh, radicalization to uh, somehow diffuse some of the negative theological uh, elements from political conflict. And this uh, certainly uh, requires a uh, great deal of work on the part of the civic society, for example, the clergy, the ecumenical approach, the media, and so on and so forth. Now, the last question about uh, the liberty and security is so critical. There is no question about it. And uh, I think the debate uh, will uh, continue and does continue in terms of striking a balance between security considerations and uh, human rights, individual rights, collective rights, um, democratic uh, principles. Uh, I just came back uh, actually a day ago, still at jet lag, from uh, Vienna, from a OEC conference, uh, represented from uh, almost uh, 100 countries uh, dealing with that particular uh, issue and that kind of threat to our society. And uh, the, the previous uh, month, uh, attending, participating at the European uh, Union Parliament uh, issue about the Al-Qaeda and what's the role of Parliament. So what I'm trying to suggest to you, and I tried to indicate before, <laughs> that the responsibility of security belongs to all of us, to the entire society. And therefore, I think uh, it's a question of awareness, number one. And number two, what can uh, segments, uh, different segments of society can do to, to participate? And what, what is really critical for us uh, who believe in democracy, uh, to protect our value system. That's number one. We don't want to go and to try to destroy the innocent and the guilty together. And it's not so simple. But at, at any rate, I, I think the um, ideological uh, mission of the United States is very, very clear. And uh, hopefully, uh, many other countries uh, will follow that particular model, but it's not easy. And that's why I think we have to stress much more the soft power approach to the problem. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to? Um, so um, I like that constellation of questions, you know, how do sex go away, how do ideologies go away, um, and if I could just add to that, um, um, given my, my latest kind of thinking about this, is, you know, how do insurgencies end? I was at a, a very interesting uh, conference on irregular warfare um, back in March, put on by OSD, and I was, I was, um, amused, I must say, by the way that we were prepped for the conference, because it was obvious there was a, a deep policy debate going on that they didn't want to expose to the outside world. So they gave us these three really obscure things to talk about. And I had to kind of suss out what they really were trying to discuss. <laughs> One of them was, we can't figure out if we're winning or losing. You know, I, I mean, that's something people want to say in public, I guess. But um, so how do you tell if you're winning in an irregular war? What, what, and this is where things always sort of end with our engineering bent military. What are the metrics we can use in a way to measure success in, in the insurgency? Um, well, the, the thing that struck me when I was first asked that question back in 2004 was that it's a very bad idea uh, when dealing with an insurgency to talk about body counts. Um, but in fact, that's, that's what we've come to. Um, by defining this as a, a counterterrorism, primarily a counterterrorism fight, uh, we're using attrition as our main um, methodology for determining success. And in a, in a insurgency, that can be actually counterproductive. 
It's not to say that you know, people don't unfortunately need to die in order for this to end. It's if that's your main tactic, and in some cases your sole tactic for dealing with an insurgency is counterproductive. So um, how do insurgencies end, I think, is another question we can add to that constellation. Can I just briefly comment uh, in response to the gentleman over here about learning from the 20th century? Uh, I, I completely agree, and I, by the way, I completely agree with everything Mary just said as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're barking up the wrong tree if we think about Al Qaeda and its brethren solely through the lens of terrorism. And 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 I've, I've written one article that made precisely this point. And you know, I said, well, look, what are these people doing? They're applying violence to achieve political ends. And in my book, that's called war. And the people who study war are military historians. Um, and I think that there would be a lot to be gained um, by you know, having military historians take on uh, this uh, problem as well. Now, it's not the only way to look at what we're facing, but I think it's a, I think it's a useful one. Um, and I think uh, that, I mean, as, as, as Mary was just hinting, as I think you were hinting in your question, that uh, doing that would allow things that are um, pretty well understood in the military history realm, in the military realm, uh, to be applied here, perhaps usefully. Um, and I just say, just to put in a plug for, for, for half of our sponsors here, um, I mean, there's, you know, from the point of view of a military historian who's, in, who's inclined to, to do the work, there's really interesting stuff uh, in these captured records. Um, and, you know, you dig in there and you're going to write a book or an article that no one's written before. Um, and um, I think, you know, there's gold in them. If I could, just for a moment, yes. I want to add something just a little bit on another area of study that would be very useful, again, looking to the past. I think most terrorism scholars agree that social movements come first, then over a period of you know, successive radicalization, you end up with a terrorist group at some point, not from every movement, obviously, but from some. Um, and then sometimes that terrorist group is successful enough to spark a broader insurgency and take over a government. It doesn't always happen that way. So this means that we need to keep in mind the broader social movement that Al-Qaeda is a part of. And we need to look at the broader social movements that are coming up now and will come in the future to see what could spawn terrorism in the future. So this, this whole realm this is really important for context. Thank you. Uh, two more questions? Yes, one at the back. Again, Malik from um, DOD. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, I understand the linkage you study the religious uh, backing of where Al-Qaeda comes from, but I mean, the common wisdom in the Muslim world, at least, is you know, that these are um, primary political as the panelists mentioned, um, political means are trying to achieve in Israel, Palestine, Kashmir, Chechnya, that have kind of been lumped into a broader global jihad and Al Qaeda. And um, I guess I was just wondering if you could talk about the nuance there. Is there a difference? Uh, do we need to? Um, I guess my question is should Al Qaeda be? Uh, thought of as a purely religious movement, political, or is it some sort of hybrid, or um, really, how is it, uh, I, I see a big difference in the way they're viewed in the Muslim world and the, and the way that they're viewed in the, in the Western world. I was just wondering if panelists could talk about that. Thank you. And the one at the back. <coughs> I'm Helen Baugh. I teach international relations at Montgomery College. My son uh, was a young officer on the USS Cole recently. We have not talked about the Cole. So I read a lot about the Cole. And I did love notice last night on TV, uh, Ali Sufan was interviewed on Rachel Maddow, and he is selling his, re his new book, Black Banners. And he was talking, he is the one. The Excuse me, could you maybe speak in the microphone? The microphone yeah. Sorry. He, Ali Sufan was the FBI analyst who spoke Arabic fluently, and he was assigned to do the interrogation of the, uh, the USS Cole bombers. And he is the one who Excuse me, we, we still can't hear you very well. Sorry, he is the one who constantly asked the CIA for information about the Malaysia meetings, <coughs> Al Midhar, uh, who was one of the September 11th bombers, one of the 22. 
and he's the one who never did get information from the CIA. And um, so I've done some background information because in the, on the interview, he was not criticizing the CRA, CIA. Uh, he was a protege of John O'Neill, and John O'Neill and Michael Scheuer had a animosity. So Ms. Storr, uh, could you tell us, I don't know, uh, uh, what you can about this? Has it been fixed? Uh, Ali Supan got a lot of information, and I'm, uh, but he didn't get quite enough. And if he'd known about Al Midhar, well, you know, things might have been different. And I know all of you have looked at this issue again and again over the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I just en encourage you, as you respond to the first lady's question, to focus on the, the, the past and, and how you how people thought about kind of political grievances, role of political grievances uh, prior to that. Uh, oh dear. Um, first of all, I, I'm sorry to hear your story. Uh, as a terrorist analyst, you you know you live every day with the knowledge that any mistake you make is going to end up with somebody getting killed. And as a matter of fact, I put a plaque on my desk um, after 9/11. I bought in some store, tchotchke store somewhere, that said, uh, you know, unless it's fatal, it's no big deal. And people would come by my desk and say, but it's all fatal. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. Um, <laughs> um, boy, I really have to, I really have to not comment too much on, on Ali Soufan or that period, except to remind everyone that The FBI is really good at publicity. The CIA stinks at it. <laughs> I really can't say anything else about it. <laughs> Just commenting briefly on those groups in the 1990s, um, absolutely very different kinds of goals, um, different kinds of ideologies, different people they appealed to. Um, Al-Qaeda uh, rhetorically supported them, and I don't know, maybe they gave them money, I, I have no, no clue, but I wouldn't be surprised. But the one group that they tried to reach out to in the 1990s, this is again in the captured documents, um, not one group, they actually reached out to a whole bunch of different groups, but the, um, one of the groups that I look at is um, the Chechen Jihad, which is a constellation of groups. Um, they failed to sort of take it over the way they really wanted. They had a profound influence on it, but they were in, um, unable to convince um, uh, Ibn Khattab that um, he should swear uh, they opt to bin Laden and put himself under the authority of the high command and make that part of their jihad. So even people that were very, very close to them ideologically, um, they were unable to convince uh, to go along with their full program. So in the 1990s, a really, really marginal group. I'd, I'd make a couple of comments. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that you're getting at, and, and Mary is too here, is that there's tremendous diversity uh, within what we easily lump together as the solid PG Hots world. And that's absolutely right. Um, uh, and issues in one part of the world differ from issues in another part of the world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, David Kilcullen has, has, has talked about this too. Um, however, that said, I don't think that that means, and I don't, don't want to be putting words in your mouth, but I, I don't think that that means that we shouldn't be talking about this broad overarching phenomenon. And the analogy, the historical analogy uh, that I look to is communism. Um, and back in the Cold War, Soviet communists were different from Hungarian communists, who were different from Chinese communists, uh, who in turn were different from the communists that you found, say, I don't know, here in the United States. Uh, there were very important differences among them, and sometimes they didn't like each other at all, throw Tito into the mix, and they definitely weren't liking each other. Um, but that didn't mean that they weren't all communists in some important sense. So if you look at it, you know, the problem from this angle, you can see unity. If you rotate the thing 90 degrees, you see you see diversity, and both I think are legitimate are legitimate views. Um, so I'll just take it back. Sorry, sure. we all want to take a crack at that one. Sorry. <laughs> um, I want to address this in terms of thinking about ideologies, uh, because this is a debate we had a lot. 
before 2001 and, and after, which is how do you understand you know, religion versus politics? It's a, it's a very important question. And what I came to for myself is going back to the original definition of ideology, which came out of the French Revolution, coined by an atheist, um, to be the science of ideas. And this is opposed to theology, which is the relationship between man and God. And so any belief, including religions, people can stretch it to the point where, you know, if they're playing God, they think they know better than everyone else. What they're really dealing with is their ideas, not what God wants, even if they think they're dealing with God, what God wants. And so this is how I understand Al-Qaeda. This is how I understand all terrorist groups, extremist groups. They all do this. Um, and maybe we can find a way to explain that to people. I don't know. One other thought here um, <coughs> on this distinction between religious issues and political issues. Um, I, I remember when I first read Milestones being tremendously amused. There's this wonderful passage in there in which uh, Kutub writes something along the lines of, uh, our enemies are going to try and turn this into some sort of political fight or an economic fight or say that it's about nationalism or that sort of thing. But we have to remember what this re really ultimately is all about and that it's about religion. Uh, and bin Laden actually echoed in somewhat similar terms that same message. Now, I don't mean that necessarily to say that that's, you know, objectively correct from all points of view from which you might wish to examine it. But what I do suggest is that to the extent that that is a view held by these people who call, our, call themselves our enemies, that we need to understand that and take that into account. But if we don't understand the adversary on his own terms, then we're creating an enemy, we're constructing an enemy for our own convenience, and that's an extraordinarily dangerous way to conduct any struggle. Thank you. Uh, two more questions? It's one at the front. Yeah. Uh, on the note of understanding the enemy on his own, a question for uh, Alec, uh, Andreas Payne, who's also in the UK. Um, you mentioned the concept of a caliphate, and there seems to be quite a bit of confusion what that actually means. David Cullen once described it more or less as a concrete geopolitical entity that was a springboard for, for them then to expand into the rest of the world. Uh, Faisal Devji recently in the landscapes of the jihad described it as a purely metaphysical, almost negative concept. Um, it just stands against the extant spatial order of the world and has no content as such. In your reading of those sources of Al-Qaeda, what do they actually say about the caliphate? What is that? You mentioned the eschatological aspect to it. What, what reality is there actually to it? What ontology do you think? Um, just really briefly. Excuse me, we'll just take one more question. Oh, uh, yeah, Ed Purvis, consultant. Uh, the focus is on organizations, but. Could you wait on the microphone? Oh, sorry. And just for people's information, we are recording it so we can produce a transcript. So if you're speaking in advance of having a microphone, okay. your words are hidden from posterity. Okay. <laughs> Ed Purvis, consultant. Uh, you're speaking about organizations, but some years ago, the focus used not to be on organizations, but on people, and on constructing uh, bio sketches as much detail as you could about the people, and analyzing the people rather than the organization. I mean, if, if you want to apply that today, you can apply it to any political party in the U.S. and can't look at the organization, you've got to look at the people. That would be a good thing if you could address it in the context of the organization. Um, so, uh, on the concept of the caliphate, um, there's, you know, uh, with a lot of the things that you're dealing with with Al Qaeda, there's always a, a difference between what they want to accomplish and what they're actually capable of accomplishing. So I'm just going to talk about it in terms of the 1990s with a, a few little mentions um, for today. Uh, in the 1990s, this was their sort of ultimate, you know, agenda of what we're heading towards and what we hope to achieve. And their vision was of a concrete, physical um, state. So they called uh, what other uh, Salafis and other uh, jihadists called the Islamic State, using the term Dawla, they called the Qudaba, because they said that that was more um, it's more Islamically correct. They, in fact, have all sorts of terms that they use for talking about things that 
um, in political Islam in general has adopted a little more Western influenced um, um, kind of um, vocabulary they want to use more authentically correct Islamic terms. Um, and so for them, that just meant the Islamic State. And we're eventually going to create the state someplace and physically apply our vision of Sharia. So their, their vision of politics is completely different from um, a more Western influenced vision of politics. They don't think first about uh, institutions, about things like succession, about how you, how you get leaders and how they're, you know, things like, they don't think in political science, our political science terms at all in some ways. Their first thought is, we need to impose Sharia. That's their, that's their political vision. And then you think about the institutions you need in order to impose Sharia. And so you need to have um, uh, judges. You have to have people who understand the law. Um, the fat that's why the fatwa um, committee has so much power, because they're sort of the, the core of the entire organization. Why they spend a lot of time, as you saw on, on the slide up there, uh, talking about the bad ulema who deserted us, because to them that's the, the first betrayal that we have was that uh, the ulema left us. Um, and then the uh, the other things you need to have, you have to have a committee to um, uh, promote virtue and prevent vice. Otherwise known as guys with big sticks going around beating anybody who doesn't do what the, the court tells you you should do, or rounds you up and takes you before the court. And then to make sure all this runs right, you have to have a cable. But see, it's almost backwards, right? It's from the bottom up. We will control people's behavior down here, and it works its way upward. So they think in terms of creating local emirates in order to eventually build this up somehow into the um, caliphate. If I may, just a, a little footnote. I, I would like to broaden uh, this uh, discussion because I, I really think we're missing uh, your question brought up, uh, the question of Taliban, but uh, I think in the 1990s, and I, I can tell you again from limited uh, experience uh, interviewing some of the terrorists uh, in Asia, in Kashmir, and as well, um, there is the, and I agree with what you said, honestly, uh, <clears throat> about the Sharia, I know that, but the broader perspective, the uh, interconnection between the between Al Qaeda in one way or another, whether it is uh, ideology or whether it is uh, exchange of um, information, uh, the uh, Afghani experience obviously was very critical, and I watched it uh, very closely at the time. And uh, now we see the results. Uh, for example, those who came from the Middle East. I, I wondered when I interviewed some some of these terrorists in Kashmir, those who came to fight from uh, North Africa, the Egyptians, the Algerians, and the others. What are they doing there? They did the same thing 